Namaste Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyanamaha Welcome back everyone. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed our first session and had an opportunity to ponder over the chosen verse. The Gita has been described variously as a bouquet composed of beautiful flowers of spiritual truth collected from the Upanishads by Swami Vivekananda and that its influence is not merely philosophical or academic but immediate and living an influence for thought and action and its ideas actually at work as a powerful shaping factor in the revival and renewal of a nation and a culture by shri aurobindo today we chose a couple of verses from the second chapter or sankhya yoga or the yoga of knowledge mainly self knowledge and equanimity at the outset of this chapter the lord elaborates on the cardinal principles of life the foundational principles the sankhya buddhi which if well understood the way forward would be clear the verses we will discuss today i realize are more relevant than ever to what is going on around us regardless of which part of the world we live in no matter where we live today due to the interconnectedness of all of us anything happening in one part of the world will have an impact on us whether we realize or not one cannot have world peace without individual peace how many of us today are able to say with conviction that we are at peace at an individual familial societal national or international level if we want transformation of this world each one of us needs to transform ourselves first so let us see what these very important verses are all about they go as follows om hari hi om shri guru bhyo namaha hari hi om shri krishna paramatmane namaha shri mad bhagavat gita ath dvitiyo dhyayah sankhya yogah shri bhagavan uvacha dhyayato vishayan pumsah sangaste shupajayate sangat sanjayate kamah kamat krodho bhijayate krodhat bhavati sammohah sammohat smriti vibhramah smriti bhramshat buddhi nashah buddhi nashat pranashyati om tat sat iti shrimad bhagavat gita su upanishad su brahma vidyayam yoga shastre shri krishna arjuna samvade sankhya yogo nama dvitiyo dhyayah hari hi om shri guru bhyo namaha hari hi om the literal meaning of these verses goes like this lord krishna said when one thinks or contemplates on the objects of the senses one develops attachment to them from attachment is born desire and from desire arises anger anger leads to delusion or clouding of judgment which results in loss or bewilderment of memory when memory is bewildered the intellect or discrimination gets destroyed and when the intellect or ability to discriminate is destroyed one is ruined or perishes here again let us look at the context of where the bhagavan is speaking and what is he speaking about a few verses before in the 54th verse arjuna had asked the lord about 
Esthita Pragna and Samadhistha. Sthita Pragnasya Ka Bhasha Samadhistasya Keshava Sthita Dheer Kim Prabhasheta Kima Sita Vrajeta Kim So Arjuna wanted to know who is Esthita Pragna? How does he sit? How does he walk? How does he talk? Now, first of all, we would need to know what is a sthita pragna and a samadhistha. This is one who has steady wisdom and who is merged in the superconscious state. In other words, the spiritual seeker and the spiritual siddha, one who has attained spiritual liberation. This is the person whose intellect has come to a state of equipoise and one whose ego is transcended since the veil of ignorance has been removed. He has realized the divine reality within him and has become one with infinity, a person who is in balance within and without. The Lord further goes on to say that such a being is so on and so forth. And the above verses are embedded in this description called Sthita Pragna Lakshana. He begins to say in these verses how through a spiraling downfall man's divinity is lost. Even his humanity is lost and man becomes animal-like when he is not able to conquer his indriyas or senses. Swami Chinmaya has called this the path of destruction which can be slightly modified to self-destruction, if you ask me. When I first came across these verses, it was almost as if a light bulb turned on in my head. This is exactly what happens to us every time we get angry. When we like this or that, whether it's an edible object or a show on TV or a social media page or even a YouTube video or a video game, we try to attain the sense object. Once we do that, we enjoy the object. But the pleasure is short-lived, so we want more and more. And finally, we're so attached to this object and we start desiring the object. We start seeking more and more of it. Then there are situations where we're not able to attain the object. This makes us angry. Whether it is what we want to eat or drink or something we want to, our child to do or not to do. Not attaining our object of desire makes us livid with anger. What follows next is that in our anger, we end up saying and doing things that are regrettable. Every one of us can recollect one or other situation where we were blinded by our anger and this led to words, thoughts, and actions that we never meant to have had. In chapter 3, the Lord says that Kama eva krodha eva cha rajoguna samudbhavaha mahashano mahapapman vidyena mihavairinam meaning desire and anger are the enemies of man and the root cause of destruction. My Guru Kamlesh Patel or Daji describes this sequence with an example that most of us can perhaps relate to. I look at a beautiful rose in a garden and admire it. Then I go back and I see it again and admire it some more. The next time I go back, I want to not only admire it but also possess it. Now I'm attached to this rose. The next time I go see the rose, I want to take the rose or the rose bush itself with me and plant it in my garden. And we can extrapolate this to what would happen if I try to get the rose and I'm told that I cannot touch the flower. From this we can learn that desire and attachment to physical, mental and intellectual objects that give us a sense of temporary pleasure can lead to our destruction. The Ashtavakra Gita, which was 
about 10 to 12,000 years ago, said that all these karma desires, vasanas, they work like visham or poison. Swami Mukundananda says that anger, lust, greed, etc. are considered by Vedic literature as manas rog or diseases of the mind. So let us see how this is an issue of the mind. The mind and the resultant thinking is very creative. It is so creative that it can make us or break us. When we like something, our mind automatically goes to that thing. Whether it is a sweet or a cigarette or a drink or a certain person or even an intellectual exercise or a video game, our mind repeatedly thinks of how we feel when we interact with this thing. We want to experience that pleasurable feeling again. When we are constantly thinking of a sense object, this constant thinking creates an attachment. So what happens when we are attached to something? This attachment crystallizes to a burning desire to possess this object and enjoy its pleasures. Once desire has developed, the next thing that happens is greed and anger. Greed comes when our desire is satisfied we want more and more. When the desire is not fulfilled, there is a raging anger. Now anger, as we all know, impairs our judgment. How many times have we said or done something in our anger that we have regretted later? We are blinded in our anger and our intellect is clouded by our emotions. When the intellect is clouded, there is a haze and viveka, or the judgment between right and wrong, is lost due to our emotions. This further leads to a certain downward spiraling that ends with the destruction of the intellect. Once this happens, our sense of intellect, our internal compass that distinguishes right from wrong, is completely lost and we are destroyed. How then shall we overcome these qualities of the human mind? How do we go about practicing this very difficult exercise of restraint? How do we control our senses, sense organs, and our mind? How do we go from a state of anger, greed, delusion, and destruction to one of contentment, calmness, compassion, and clarity? The way to go about this is to try to attain a state of objectivity or detachment from sense objects. To know that true happiness does not reside in external objects. The sage Ashtavakra said, the way to reach emancipation or attaining true happiness is by reducing desires and embracing the qualities of Kshama, forgiveness, Daya, compassion, Satya, truth, arjava, sincerity, and santosha, happiness. Of course, it is more easily said than practiced, as it is no easy task to control our anger and desires, and thereby maintain an equipoised intellect. The Lord himself has given us the way in verse 58 of this chapter. He says, Yada samharate chayam kurmongani vasarvashaha indriyani indriyate bhyaha tasya pragna pratishtita. So the way to attain divine wisdom is to withdraw the sense organs from the external objects of pleasure, like a tortoise withdraws its limbs at the sign of danger and instead focus the sense organs on the Lord. Swami Chinmayananda has said, he has given a simple advice, attach to detach. Attach yourself to the higher and you will be detached from the lower. The intellect is thus anchored in the Lord and that self within and the mind and the organs will be in control of that anchored intellect. 
The Sthita Prajna has a rein on all his organs and uses them for desireless and selfless actions. He or she uses the organs for the desireless pursuit of Swadharma. Every breath and action is used in the highest spiritual quest. In my personal experience, it's a very slow and steady rise towards perfection by daily sadhana, prayer, contemplation, and meditation, which can help go a long way in achieving this equanimity or moderation in life. Even with daily practice, we face everyday challenges in today's world filled with material temptations of the body, mind, and intellect that we need to handle while maintaining our equipoise. If we are lucky, we will find a spiritual guide or guru who will help us with this pursuit of spiritual enlightenment and will pull us along with him or her to a state of equanimity. I would like to add that even if we don't want to attain these positive qualities for spiritual elevation, we should try to do it because these concepts that were taught to us by our sages, and of course, Lord Krishna himself, are now being shown by his new scientific studies to be good for our mental and psychological health. Studies have shown that amyloid the protein that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease and other toxins in the brain are removed by certain lifestyle habits that include regular and adequate sleep, exercise, plant-based diet, and most importantly, the subconscious mindset of love, positive thinking, service, and gratitude, improving mental health and memory. The Center for Brain Studies at Harvard University includes these concepts of moving from selfishness to self-awareness and increasing consciousness in their practices for a healthy brain. Finally, as I learn these verses today, I wonder why such practical education is not taught in our textbooks. Anyone who listens to this logical stepwise spiraling of self-destruction would at least make an attempt to work on themselves. And if we did so, the earlier in our lives, the better. In fact, Acharya Vinoba Bhave has written in his talks on the Gita, which he delivered to the inmates in the jails of the Indian independence movement, which was a battlefield in itself, that thousands of Satyagrahi men and women regularly read these verses in their evening prayers. If these verses could be taken to every home in every village, he said, what a happy thing it would be. I say that these verses should be taught in every school across the world if we want humanity to progress in the right direction. Thank you for listening. As always, we are grateful for your attention and look forward to meeting you next time. Once again, please forgive us any mistakes and share your thoughts and feedback in the comments section. Shri Krishna Paramastu.